name in the chat box. Let us know where you're joining us from. Um, we're joined today by Debbie Roberts, um, who is the author of our Discover Science series, uh, which is what this session, uh, Turning Primary Scientists into CSEC Level Scientists, is focused on. Uh, so Debbie will be running the session, the lovely Debbie, who you may have seen before in some of our other uh, webinars um, on inquiry-based learning. Um, this is the first uh, event of our Summer of Science, which you can see behind me. Um, <laughs> and that was running uh, from now until September. So on our social channels, you'll see lots of great um, engaging science material focused around our some of our science titles. Um, so at the moment, we're focusing on Discover Science, um, Discover Science even, <laughs> not Summer of Science, which I keep saying. Um, so yes, Debbie will be hosting the session. Um, the session will run for an hour. Um, after the session, you'll receive your certificate automatically. And then within the next 24 hours or so, we'll be sending you the slides and the recording. If you miss anything, um, you can watch back again tomorrow um, if you think you've missed something. So not to worry. Um, please do use the chat box. Say hello if you're with us. Um, if you can hear me, hopefully you can. Um, and yeah, enjoy. Um, I'll pass you over to Debbie um, and I will see you all in an hour. Um, enjoy, everybody. Thank you. Oh, hello, Joanne from St. Lucia. How are you? I'm glad you can hear us. OK, so if you've been in my webinars before, you know that I really do value your input. So please use the chat box. Um, any questions, any comments, anything you want me to pick up on? Obviously, we put a lot of effort into these presentations, but if you have got a question or you need something clarifying, then it's, this is all about you. So please use the chat box. And if nothing else, at least I know that you're still with me. <laughs> so this is really exciting. And I'm really, really um, honored, privileged to be um, one of the first, well, the first event for the Summer of Science. So obviously I've got a science background and so I'm so happy to be here uh, working with Mike Millen on one of the best projects I've ever worked on, the Discover Science series. So um, thank you for giving up your val valuable time. And I hope that you find this really useful. So it's really exciting. Yay, summer of science. So let's get on with it. So the whole point of this is to make sure that you are all really confident in delivering student-led inquiry-based lessons. So in inquiry-based learning, the, the whole, not the whole, but one of the major targets and objectives is to support students in developing key skills. These skills are not just for science. The skills are cross-curricular and the lifelong skills. At the heart of inquiry-based learning is always a question. And if we can inspire our students so well that they actually begin to ask questions about the content that we're teaching, then we're nearly there. You know yourself, if you're engaged and you're interested, you will put more effort in. And the more effort that is put in or applied, then the better recall and it sits nicely into your long-term memory. And so I am a lead in inquiry-based learning and everything that I've ever authored, which I think is, I think it's a past 200 now, but everything I've ever authored is around inquiry-based learning. It's the only way that I know how to uh, teach effectively. And more than ever after the pandemic, we need our teaching time to be very efficient because we want the best for our students. So it's about harnessing that interest, that engagement, about really inspiring students to be interested, interested and want to know more about the subject content. We want our students to be independent, practical scientists. Now, there's a word, practical. We need them to be 
hands on. We can't afford to think, well, we'll just demonstrate it. It's safer, it's quicker, it's more cost effective. It's not actually. I said to my trainee teachers, if you only teach one practical, but you teach it well, one investigation, one experiment, and it's done well, it's better than demonstrating all of them. Because that's hands-on, minds-on learning, which drives that information into the long-term memory, and then it can be efficiently recalled, and that's what we're working towards. So we're also looking at the benefits of project-based learning because it's engaging, it promotes blended learning, it promotes and supports all the skills that we need our students to acquire and be confident to use if we want them to be successful at the CSEC level. So this webinar is all about how Discover Science prepares and enables our students to transition from primary to CSEC scientists. So it's all about that smooth transition from that sound, uh, that sound foundation that they've acquired prior to preparation for CSEC. So let's, let's get moving. Now we know what, we're, what we want to do, let's see if we can achieve it. So, okay, I can tell you honestly, and if any of you have worked with me before, if I've met any of you out there in the Caribbean, then you will know that I've been linked to the Caribbean for a great number of years, probably going towards nine maybe. But anyway, I can tell you that I have been out in the Caribbean, I've worked in schools, I've worked with teachers. And for that reason, these books, these resources are written with you in mind they're not written for they are not just written for you they're almost written with you it's based on an understanding of how your learners learn and how teachers teach i've been out to the caribbean as i said i've been in schools and so these books were written when i sat here in the uk in yorkshire i had you in mind as i wrote these words it integrates the curriculum of all of the islands. So with a lot of your support, I was able to acquire copies of the curriculum from all around the Caribbean. And I really worked hard to map each curriculum against each other so that I could author a book, which obviously has a limited number of pages um, that would address all of the objectives of all of the islands and so therefore that part of it was very time consuming but the end product means that all of you can can confidently use the resources and know that they address all of the csec requirements i've also looked at the csec some of the csec sample exam papers and examination and assessment methods and we've also included that as um, practice assessments, as end of topic questions, so that the students can become familiar with the style of assessment. I also co-authored the revision guides and the revision guides are for CSEC and they are specifically for that examination. The content is covered, but also as I enjoy using um, the resources, there are lots of revision techniques and revision strategies and styles also promoted in the student books. So it's a big revision focused resource. It builds extremely well on mission science, but it's not essential. It's, you can still use Discover Science resources if you've never used Mission Science. So it builds nicely and it makes it a nice, comfortable transition from Mission to Discover because the students will recognise some of the familiar key things that are in there, but it's not essential. So don't think, well, we didn't use Mission, so therefore we can't use this. You can, 
but it's nice for the students that will recognize some of the features, some of the methods, some of the icons, and it will be comfortable, though I think, and we've been told by students, that they do find it more grown up. It's specifically for them. It's not something that's been adapted. So it's a nice transition. We've kept a lot of the features for that fam familiarity, but we've also extended the features. So good afternoon. My phone might touch shut down. Oh no. Sorry, Stacey from Jamaica. You're, it looks like you're having problems with your technology. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant labour saving devices when everything works well. So welcome. You've not missed anything. You're fine. So there they are, there are the covers. I'm really, really pleased with these. I'm, I really wanted these to look suitable for this age group, something that's a little bit more interesting, a little bit more challenging, and clearly shows what the objectives for that, that age group is, for that year group. And so they look really nice, clean, fresh, and they're engaging. They look you want to open the book, you want to find out what's in there. They're much thicker, they're bigger than mission science books because obviously there's a lot more content. So what's included? Well, for each year group, we have a student book, which is a modern, but yet a traditional um, textbook in that it's got all the facts and all the information that's needed for CSEC, but it's a little bit more updated and it's user friendly. We then have a workbook, which is a supporting workbook to the student books. They're really good because it's great for differentiation and it's great for extending learning or supporting learning. And then, of course, you have the free online teacher's guides. Now, we say comprehensive because if you've been in my webinars in the past, I, I'm, I, I'm sure I've told you this story before. When I first started writing books... I was in a meeting and I was the only practicing teacher that was part of the team at the time. It wasn't this publisher, by the way. And I was asked, you're a teacher. What would you use a teacher guide for? And I thought to myself, okay, should I be honest? And that potentially could be the end of my new <laughs> authoring career. Or shall I... Um, say what I think they want to hear and I decided because I'm an honest person that I would tell the truth and I worked in a very very large comprehensive school so students from the age 11 to 18 and I taught physics and chemistry to all the children it was a very old school it did not have the resources or the infrastructure for the amount of children that were there and the budget was very low we worked in a very 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 tight budget finances were not great and I said I have got a teacher's guide and I do use it every day I use it when we're doing experiments that uh, produce fumes to lodge my window open for ventilation because the window's broken and that's all I ever used one for. The reason being, as a teacher, have you really got time to read a book that's this thick? Yes, they're full of important, very useful strategies and pedagogy, but as a teacher, a practicing teacher, I just didn't have the time to read that. I wanted something that I could open and use. And that's what we wrote. I actually said, I remember in the planning stage, you saying, please, please, can we author a useful, user-friendly teacher guide? And I am so proud that these are the best teacher guides that I've ever worked on. And if I was teaching, I would use them. Everything is clear, concise, and it doesn't give you that over information. It gives you the straight facts so that you can use it quickly and easily. So I hope you like them. So discover science. It's all about curiosity. What we want is the hands-on, minds-on, student-led learning. 
which results in hands-off teacher-led learning and that's the situation that we need to be in my proudest moment as a teacher was in a classroom with 50 plus students because it was a busy school and the head teacher came in and said where's miss roberts and one of the students said i don't know i haven't seen her for ages that is the biggest compliment that you could have as a teacher it's not all about you I was actually sat at the back of the room working with some students who, who needed some support. The rest of them had been trained into being independent thinkers and they were getting on with it. They, were, they hadn't seen me because they didn't need to see me because they were independent workers and they were quite happy to work independently. And if you get that situation, you know you've done best job. So the Discover Science series is all about preparation for CSEC. Okay, it's about getting our scientists to be at the right level to be successful in terminal assessments in CSEC. As educationalists, we would like to think in an ideal world that we do not teach to assessment. But I'm sorry, but we do. We do teach to assessment. It's our job as educators, teachers, leaders of schools, heads of year, anyone in education. It's our job. It's our main focus to get these students to pass exams. Yes, we want them to enjoy the subject. We want them to be happy. We want them to be successful. But in order to get to the next level, no matter where you are, the order to, the, the way of getting to the next level, you have to be successful in assessment. And if we don't teach our students how to pass exams, we're delivering a disservice because they won't get any further. They won't make any progress. We need scientists. The world the world evolves around science, technology, engineering, maths and arts. That's what keeps us, the progress, driving forward, technology increasing year on year. Behind that, that driving force is enthusiastic scientists who are confident to think outside the box. We would not have, we would not be communicating with each other now if scientists had not thought outside the box and developed the internet. And when I say we never make a mistake in science, we do not make mistakes. Sometimes we do make mistakes, but it doesn't go wrong. We know what to do. We know how to keep safe. It sometimes might appear to have gone wrong. It doesn't go wrong. We might not get the result that we're looking for. We might not get the result we wanted, but it's not wrong. Everything we do in science gives us another opportunity to develop something else. For example, Buxminster Fullerene. We could say that was from a mistake. That went wrong in the eyes of the scientists, but what they actually discovered was something that has transformed technology forever. So nothing goes wrong, but we need to be at that confident level. So we're creating independent researchers as well. We have no idea what our students will be doing in their place of work. We have no idea what the expectations will be. Technology is progressing at such a rapid rate that we don't have a clue what it will look like in 15, 20 years time. We just don't. But we do know that the, the employment, the employees of the future will need to be independent thinkers, be able to problem solve, be able to collaborate with others and research. Research is a key thing. If I said to you now, what is a Buxminster Fullerene? If you didn't know, the first thing you would do 
is a search. You would pick your phone up like poor Stasis has just decided not to work. You would pick up a device and you would do a search, an online search. That situation will increase much further and dependence on the internet will increase. We're pretty sure of that. Some form of technology will definitely be in the workplace. And so research is preparing our students for the future. Discover Science embeds the techniques through, act techniques through activities, investigations, experimentation. So at the start, we have the contents page. I really like the contents page. How can one obtain the student workbooks and teacher guides? One, well, that's what a question basically for Macmillan, and I'm, and I'm sure they will answer that one. But the teacher guides are free when you purchase the student books. So the access to the online teacher guides is a free resource. Um, if we've not answered that question by the end of this webinar, drop me another line in the chat box and I'll make sure I find that out for you. So the contents page is not just a contents page. A contents page is a resource as well for the student and the teacher, in fact, all investors. When we say to students, when I'm observing lessons, well, this, look up water in the book. So many times I hear, what page is it on? And the reason for that is that our students becoming less and less and less competent in using paper hard copy books. Now recently I did some research and I think I did a webinar on, on this as well for, for Macmillan and I did some research into whether students actually need paper copies. Do they need to access books or can they just use online resources? Can they use electronic devices? Do, they, do we actually need a library? The evidence is that when we pick up a book, we use all of our senses. We use the sense of touch, smell, sight, and we can flick back and forth. We can look at something and then think, don't quite understand that. I need to look back and, and we can work at our own pace. When we're using our senses repeatedly, when we carry out an activity, the information is processed more. And so it is stored in the long-term memory. So my research discovered that paper copy, paper books are useful because it, the information is stored more accurately in the long-term memory. Now, when we want to recall that information, it's also more efficient, it's better, it's more reliable. And so, yes, using books actually promotes our recall. So it is important. Now, the contents page is not only important for the students getting to know and getting to be able to reuse that resource. It's also a great tick box. It's a great resource for teachers. And this is how I've used it when I'm teaching. You can't always teach the sections in the right order or the units in the right order. It could be that you haven't got enough resources for everyone in that year group to be doing the same thing at the same time. I don't know, you might not have enough test tubes, enough Bunsen burners. And so sometimes we have to change in a different, we have to teach in a different order. And that's absolutely fine. You can teach these sections and these units in whatever order you like. I would recommend that you do the working scientifically and working as a scientist first because that supports students with the skills that are actually needed to investigate and experiment safely. And so I would recommend that you always teach that first if you can, but you can teach the rest in what order you like. Now you can be confident if you use this almost as a tick box, you can be confident that, that by the time you come to the end of that year group, you have covered everything that is required in preparation for CSEC, everything. And so it's great for confidence. You know, if you, if please don't let it happen again, but if anything ever happened like the pandemic, I don't know if there was some problem, the school closed and you had some time away, whatever things happen, 
you could return to that and know that everything's been taught and that your students are fully prepared for the next stage. So it's, it's a useful resource for everyone. This is the Working Scientifically introductory page. And as you can see, it's got the key words, the key um, features, if you like. It's got exactly what we'll learn. This is kind of like a mind map. Students could use this, and I envisage students using it to actually add to it. What does technology actually mean? Oh, and as we learn it, we can add information to it. Becomes a fantastic revision tool. So that is a mind map really of how we'll work our way through working scientifically. We'll understand the difference between science technology. We'll look at safety symbols, the, the most important scientific method. I know that in some of the CSEC assessments, it refers to science, scientific methodology. We'll learn the proper SI units for all the key measurements that are needed for CSEC. And so, that's what the opening page of Working Scientifically looks like. And in there, we're supporting students in the acquiring of key skills that will be built on year in, year on, year on. This is an example of one of the working pages. So this is what it looks like. And I think you'll find, you know, for me, it's colourful, but it's not overpowering. There's not too much text there, which can often become quite intimidating. I know if I open a page and it's full and I think, oh my gosh, I can't get, I can't read all that. It's intimidating. These are nicely thought out and the features are sparingly used, but they direct your view to certain things. And every page uses the same features. Lots of the features are the same as in the mission science books which again means that we're comfortable we recognize them we know what that is and so it makes a nice transition from one stage into the other so we've got science in action so many times students say to me i don't know why we have to learn this when am i ever going to use that in the real world this tells you how you'll use that in the real world it's about so, you know, there's one, safety symbols. These symbols are the real symbols. If you're working in science in your future career, you will use these safety symbols. Doesn't matter what country you work in, what country you live in, those safety symbols are roughly the same everywhere. And so we've got discussion points. Now I'll pick up on this a little bit later on. We've also got safety. There's the safety icon. We need to stop for a moment and think about what we've got to do in order to keep everyone around us safe. So that's what a standard page looks like, and that's in the Working Scientifically unit. This is about the scientific method where we work through from a question, we start to think about an hypothesis, making predictions. These are all unpicked with examples so that a student basically could pick that up and say, I don't know what an hypothesis is. Turn the page. And it's very simple language, quick and easy to learn and to understand. We see there the recording and reporting. Now, that was taken from a student who'd carried out a really good investigation and the question was, look at your data that you've collected, analyze the data and draw a conclusion from it. And this student said, I, I, I don't know what the data means. And I said, oh, okay. So he said, so I, I, can't, I can't draw a conclusion. How can I do a conclusion? Because I don't, I, I don't, I don't know what my, my results are telling me. And that was, well, why? Because I don't understand them. This justifies why we spend time drawing tables of results. Because a table of results keeps your data clear and easy to read. He said, can't I just use someone else's results? And I said, well, where's your method? Where's your scientific method? Well, I didn't write it down. Well, no, you can't use anyone else's results then because you don't know that you carried out exactly the same investigation. So what can I do then? Well, you need to re repeat the investigation. But it's the end of the lesson. 
Well, the only time I can supervise you doing it is after school. So you'll need to come back, draw a table of results, write down your scientific method, repeat the investigation, record your results, and then finish the lesson, which is drawing a conclusion. He did that. Lesson learned. A great lesson learned. Take time to record your results properly. Otherwise, you might have to spend more of your time actually doing it. The lesson also is, if you're a scientist, you need to be able to share your data with other scientists. So it's really important that you all follow the same method. Can you see that my ideas in writing this were based on what students have said to me over the years? I wanted to justify why we carry out investigations, why we write a scientific method, why we record results. I wanted the book to justify this to students so that they become brilliant scientists. So this is a representation of scientific method. I know it says we can go back if the hypothesis is fault, we can go back. We can also start anywhere. If we've already got a question or if we've already written an hypothesis, we can reuse that. We don't have to go through the old method. If your students are great, asking questions and researching around a topic but not very good at constructing an hypothesis if every single investigation you carried it out religiously with it they would never get past constructing an hypothesis they would never start to test use glasswork be safe draw conclusions they would never get that far so can you see that sometimes we just have to support them and let them slot into that method at different times that's truly what we need to do for independent learners. So I'm asking you with your class, I don't know how many children, how many students you have in your class. I'm saying to you, right, I want you to carry out lots of investigations, lots of experiments, lots of hands-on activities, and I want the students to work independently. And I can see you're thinking, if you've not had experience in inquiry-based learning, whoa. How am I going to do that with my class? Well, you can do it. You can do it by using resources like this. When I first started teaching, I can remember thinking one Sunday evening, why? Why do we all sit here on a Sunday evening planning the same lessons? And I just could not understand. And in the whole time I was teaching, I never got to a position where we actually shared resources. This is sharing resources. You're sharing my experience when I wrote it. You're sharing all the reviewers who looked at it and questioned and challenged. You're sharing the editors who have looked at it and thought that doesn't quite make sense. I can't, I wouldn't follow that. And so by the time this gets to you and you open the page, it's as good as it can be. It's better than I could plan for every single lesson because I just haven't got that huge amount of expertise all the time. And so if you follow these, you can train your children to be inquiry-based, independent learners who work safely, who keep themselves safe and everyone around them. I was working in a primary school and I, I took them some free glassware, test tubes, boiling tubes, and I was told we can't use them in primary school, they're dangerous. And I said, why are they dangerous? And they said, well, they might break. Immediately I thought, but I've seen these students drinking out of glass, drinking water from glass bottles and glass cups, glass beakers and things. So I know, I know they can handle glassware quite safely. If we say to our students all of the time, that's dangerous, don't do it. Sometimes I take my godson out and I sit in the park and I listen and I hear parents and carers shouting, don't do that, it's dangerous. <gasps> don't stand on there, it's dangerous. Don't climb on that, it's dangerous. And so we are breeding a society of people that are wrapped in bubble wrap, that never, ever, ever take a risk. 
And if you never take a risk, you do not recognise risk and you cannot manage risk. If you give a child or a student who's a little bit older glassware and you tell them how to use it carefully, sensibly, how, what to do if it breaks, because it probably will at some point, what do you do if it breaks, how do you manage the situation safely? So we recognise the risk, we manage it, and we're safe. So you'll see that from this, there are lots of safety tips, lots of working scientifically, and lots of opportunities to be practising scientists. We can't, we can't expect our children to take up science if they've never actually experienced it. So this is a page about measuring. So again, it justifies why do we use these SI units? So we've got a working like a scientist. So we're saying that the reason we use SI units is because everyone around the world uses the same units. We might in the UK and in the Caribbean say miles per hour and in other countries I might say kilometers per hour. But we all know the SI unit, what the standard unit should be. And if we're taught that, we understand that. So on every page we have, what will I learn? Note it says, what will I learn? Not what will you learn? I'm not telling you what to learn. I'm telling you what I, if I'm the student, I need to know this. I need to know this to, to be a successful CSEC person. I need to be successful and to be successful, I need to be independent and I need to be responsible for my own learning. I've got my qualifications. You teachers have got your qualifications. It's the student that the qualifications are important to. And we need them to take responsibility for that. So we've then got activities. They all look the same. They're all in that little box. And it says, in unit one, it'd be activity one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, on it goes, and the same in every unit, so that you can refer back to activities and find them quickly and easily. You'll notice also that there's a STEAM feature. That STEAM feature is really important because STEAM now is, science is becoming, and, and it, quite rightly, in education, science, technology, engineering, art and maths should be taught together. For me, maths is science and science is maths. Because in science, we sometimes use mathematical skills before they actually learn them in maths, because we have to. And balancing equations probably comes before equations in some maths curriculum. So it's all together. So science, science comes up with these ideas. Technologists take them a little bit further. Engineers build prototypes. We use the maths, we use the art to make these prototypes efficient, better, more useful. And so STEAM is really important in our future. So you can imagine that most of these activities are science. We can take the science box for most of them. But what I tried to do was I tried to make them so that we could cover to support technology, engineering, art, maths. So all of them in a unit, there should be activities that incorporate all of those areas because that's the future and students need to know what they're actually learning what am I actually doing this activity for what it is what's it about what can I achieve from this and so that's why it's important that we've got steam in there I hope you'll find them useful and be mindful that, well, this could be technology. Yeah, it could, but we're focusing on science there, if that makes sense. But yeah, most, lots of them, more than one thing. So there we've got another one, measuring without instruments. I know that if some of you have been to my face-to-face -face sessions out in the Caribbean, I like to, I like to do this activity with, with teachers and educators and teacher trainers even. The things we've measured, I remember being in Dominica and someone was using a smartphone to measure the room as a unit of measurement. And then we discussed, so why why do we have to measure everything in kilometres then? What, why, is, why can't we measure them in sizes of a smartphone or size of your forearm? Because they vary. 
and so the measurement's not accurate. And it kind of justifies why we have to use those specific units of measurement. So here's another introductory page. Again, the artwork is up to date. It's meaningful to the students of today. It's things that they're familiar with. So what does that do? It starts that curiosity. Why is someone using the scooter on that page? Why is someone having their hair coloured, straightened? Um, it's about real life situations and linking that in to the science that's actually taking place in that situation. So they might be aware of the, what's happening, but they're completely unaware of the science behind it. And then they'll say things like science is boring, but yet they'll quite happily use a skateboard or a scooter. And so the introductory pages are to draw the students in so that they're interested because if they start asking the questions, they want to find the answer. And if they want to find the answer, they'll put a lot more effort in. So the student-led opportunities to really, really feed that curiosity and get that interest going. So all of the introductory pages link to a word web activity. Now, these are in line with mission science as well, because we did lots about key words and key vocabulary, because we were building that scientific um, foundation. Some of the words and the vocabulary in science don't make any sense to us. Photosynthesis, haemoglobin, they're just difficult words to remember, to say, and to spell. And that's because science is based on an ancestry of scientists from who speak a different language, Latin, Greek. And so we always want to promote the key words because if we can't say the word, we will struggle to to spell them, which means then we can't record them in an assessment. And that could be the difference between a pass or a fail. And as we are getting these students ready for CSEC, then it's our duty to introduce them to some of the vo vo complex vocabulary. And so we have the word web activity for every unit. We don't want students going away and pick up and picking up a dictionary or going online and looking up words and writing out definitions that isn't learning keywords but what they can do is these these activities where do you recognize any of these words have you experienced any of these words talk about the words look at the word web as you work through your workbook add working definitions meaningful definitions that you a writing based on your experience of that word. You're not copying it. One of my students' glossaries said, I was checking through the glossary and it said, producer, we were doing interdependence. We were doing about food chains. And it said, a producer. And the student had written, a person who makes TV programs or movies. It obviously just copied it from the dictionary when in actual fact the producer of food chains means something quite different to that. And so it's really important that if they don't understand the word, they can't define it, that's fine. But as they work through the unit, keep encouraging your students to go back. Go back and have a look. Can you define any of the words now? Are some of them becoming clearer? And then they will remember the words and they'll be able to use the words successfully. We've always got this, also got this traffic light system where students were introduced to the objectives, all of the objectives for the unit in the introductory page. We encourage them to go and think about and discuss the objectives. How do they feel before they've even turned the page? How do they feel about those objectives for the whole unit? If they absolutely have no idea and they need to learn about that, that's red. If it's green, they understand it fully. If all of the class are green, I would suggest you assess them in a nice way, what I've learned. And if they definitely do fully understand it, don't teach it again. 
No reason to waste your time teaching that again. Address the amber and the red, but be sure that they are actually on green. And again, encourage them to go back, keep going back. What does that do? Well, as they work through, we would like, we hope, the reds will change to green. The reds might change to amber. For us, that tells us that they are making progress. And for them, when they go home and say, I haven't learned anything today. What did you do today at school? Nothing. What did you learn today at school? I can't remember. That's what I used to get from my student, my children. But using things like this, they can look at it and think, wow, nearly all of the objectives were red. And now almost all are amber or green. I am learning. I am making progress. I'm a good scientist. I'm good at what I do. And so it promotes confidence in a subject that they often hear is, it's too hard. Lots of the students in a student voice ticked that they didn't like science because it was too hard. And these were 11 year old children. So I, I talked to some of them and said, why, why do you think it's hard? You've not studied at this level. You've only just started at this level. And they all said, brother or cousin or friend or parent said that science and maths are really hard. And that's, that's what they trust. So we have to break that down by showing them that it's not. Well, it, it's definitely a challenge. But with support, we wouldn't be here, would we, if it was that difficult? This is a sample of the teacher guide online. I hope you can see that that is not daunting. We've got the keywords, the objectives, an introduction to the lesson. What background knowledge do they need to know to actually get engaged in this? Um, how is science and action actually used? Discussion points. And remember, the discussion questions are not assessment questions. The discussion questions are what they say. We used to call them talk about. As we're getting older, we're now saying discuss. Discuss the questions. What are your ideas? Justify your ideas. What we're actually doing is we're teaching great science methodology because we're saying to them, what do you think about this? And why do you think that? And that's how we formulate hypotheses and prediction. They're not guesses. They are based on knowledge, research, background information. So the discussions hold that quality. They also encourage students to vocalise vocabulary. So when they're talking to each other, they're actually saying the words and they're saying them in a very low threatening, and I use that term lightly, threatening environment. You know, if you've ever, if we were together now in a lecture theatre and I asked you a question, you know yourself putting your hand up in a group of people when you're not actually 100% certain because you're learning is really quite intimidating and threatening. But yet talking to the person next to you, you can say, well, I think it's this. What do you think? Oh, yeah, it could be that. But, and you're learning. The research tells us students learn more from each other than they do us. And it's because they problem solve, they communicate and collaborate to problem solve a question. So the discussions are not assessment questions. They are there just to promote a conversation. They learn more from each other. So there are a couple of examples of discussion points. There are discussion points on every single page, often numerous. We do have reviewing of learning because it's part of education. It's how we learn. If you don't assess how you learn, you don't know you've learned it, do you? And if you don't get things, you know, if you don't make errors in a assessments, you don't actually learn anything. Because learning is when we develop knowledge. And if we just put guest a, 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 in a multi-choice, and we managed to pass the assessment, we think we knew it, but actually we didn't know anything. No learning's taken place whatsoever. 
So we review the learning and this is in line with the CSEC assessment. So we used CSEC, we are still using the um, papers, sample questions to actually make sure that the type of questioning matched so that the students are prepared to use those assessments. They can confidently read the question, think about it, process it and then formulate a successful and efficient and effective answer and actually formulate it and put pen to paper using the keywords and key language. So here we've got some of the research tasks that we know. We know that students will need to be good researchers and that's using the internet, using books, using any resources that are available. They need to be able to recognise if the information they're looking at is reliable. Does it come from a reliable source? Is it up to date? Is it topical? Is it someone's, is it biased? Is it someone's opinion? If you're reading something I don't know about electricity and it's written by an electricity company who sell their product, you wouldn't think it was as reliable because they've got an invested interest. It would encourage you to go and look at something else. We need students to be able to recognise this. That's out of date. I need to check that. That's not a reliable resource. I need to check that. That information. You know you've done a good job when some of your students say there was an advertisement on TV in a newspaper on a billboard and it said 99% of germs are killed using this product. They asked two people, that's not reliable. And that's what a student once said to me, that's not reliable. They only asked three people, that's not reliable. How can they, how can they advertise that information when they've only got three pieces of data? It's simple really, but it comes from experience. So there, there's the research icon feature. All of the investigations, just like in mission science, are really visibly an investigation. And again, like the activities, they are numbered separately. So you can quickly and easily find them. You remember when you did the investigation, it's number 3.2 in your book. Oh yeah, it, they can find them easily. They stand out from the page because they're on that graph paper, which then becomes almost a, a trigger right we're doing an investigation we're doing an activity we don't just do practicals for practical sake all of the practicals promote inquiry skills they promote scientific skills but they are also linked to content because i was adamant and i've always been adamant that the content should be a blend, it should be together with the skills. It can't be taught separately. If you said to a student, we're doing reliability, write a sentence about reliability, ask these questions, answer these questions about reliability, and then they actually got on and did an investigation about reliability, which would they understand the most and which would they remember? And then where appropriate, we also have artwork, often photographs, up-to-date photographs, to, what is it? There's a saying, isn't there, about, oh, I don't know, a thousand words can be said in a picture, or a picture paints a thousand words. And it's true. It not only can be quite, it give you a good explanation, but it can also just clarify things that you read in. Ah, oh, yeah, I get that now, yeah. And so, and it can also stimulate, I want to learn that, I want to read that. So it's all inquiry based, it's all topical and it's all relevant and it's all about you. The pictures are, I even know where that picture was taken. So the pictures are all in the Caribbean. As many of the scientists as we could possibly find are all Caribbean scientists. It's all about where the students live, not some country miles away written by someone who's never been to your, your locality. So it's for you and the students should recognise things, recognise places, recognise events. 
So we explain what snow and hail is because the chances are not many students will have seen that, but they need to know that because it's precipitation. And so just because you can't or might not witness it firsthand is still our responsibility to teach it. Here a student said, primary student told me that a cloud was a bag of water. Now I could have said, no, it's not. What it is, is this, but I didn't. I said, oh, well, if that's what you think, but you can actually make clouds if you do this and off they went. It wasn't part of the lesson that I planned, but we were doing about the, the water cycle and they had a massive misconception about clouds. If you can address things immediately, and I know this is a big ask, I have worked in a classroom, and um, you're answering the question straight away. They understand it's stored straight away. So it's not a waste of time, but it can often mean that you have to think outside the box. So then we move on to the workbook. That could be an assessment page. That could be one of the times where the students say, yes, I understand the water cycle. Okay, then complete this page. If they all do it really well, then yeah, they probably have been taught the water cycle and they do remember it. So it can become that. It can also become an activity to sort of reinforce the learning and their understanding so that they can actually have a hands-on experience of, right, that is what the water cycle means. This is the vocabulary that's linked to the water cycle. Do I actually understand the process? So it can be used in that way. And this is another workbook page. And I know you might think, well, this, the students got to do a lot of writing on there. Students have to do a lot of writing in some exams. And so we need to train them. And the only way that you can train a child to read a question, think about what it's asking, think about what it wants you to write as an answer, is to practice. And so there are opportunities in the workbook to practice. Some of these are quite challenging. Some of them are supportive. So the workbook really is the prep for CSEG because it's got lots of opportunities for children and students to work independently. And when they're working independently, or even if they're working with a partner, they're really starting to think about that deeper level of understanding. And they, in order to answer the questions, they really do have to understand it. And here we have an application. So it's in the workbook again, but they're actually applying the knowledge. They might not be asked a question that's specifically about, is that smoke or is that steam? It's steam. What is steam? It's, this is actually water vapour. Water vapour is a greenhouse gas. Is it? Another misconception. Greenhouse gases are affecting the climate. Climate is topical. So this is about applying and synthesizing knowledge. So you can see, look at that, four hands-on activities, all using different aspects of STEAM on one page. How long would it take you to think that, think about those activities? I can tell you it's quite a while, but that's my job. So let me do that and you do the teaching. <laughs> it's project-based. You know, during a uh, lockdown pandemic, this uh, type of blended learning really, really, really came into its, its own. We realised how useful it was for students to be able to work collaboratively, to work remotely. And most of the students really enjoy the project and it's good science. It's based on research, collaboration, often working as a team. So there'll be a team leader. So, so many skills are incorporated in an area of learning that they really enjoy. And at the end of every unit, revision. Find your style. So there's lots of different styles, techniques, um, all incorporated at the end of each unit so that students can actually learn what style works for them. And then when they're progressing in science in other subjects as well, because the cross curricular, they know what works for them. They know that if they're doing something that's like mathematical, 
that style might work. If they're doing something that's analytical, that style might work. And they become, if I had time, I would unpick it further, but who taught you to revise? And the answer would probably be no one. So that's why we've got revision styles. We've also got assessments, which again, throughout the test practice papers and the assessments throughout each grade, each book, they are in the style of CSEC in that preparation for CSEC, that transition to CSEC. I can't thank you enough for giving up your valuable time and your downtime. I love working with you all. I miss your sharing your amazing expertise. But one day, I'm sure we'll be together again. I really enjoyed that. I love these resources and I hope you too. And it is, I'm so happy to be at the beginning of our Summer of Science. It's such a fantastic thing. I'm, it, I'm so proud of the fact that um, science has been given its own status. So thank you so much for sharing this experience with me. I really have enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, love the hand emojis in the chat there from Shannon. Thank you. Um, brilliant. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're at the start of our Summer of Science, so there'll be a lot more uh, events like this to come. Um, and thank you so much to everyone for joining us and giving up your time. Um, hope everyone enjoyed it. I'm sure you did. It was fantastic. Thank you, Debbie. As thank always, you. Uh, awesome session. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> great to see the nice feedback so um you automatically get your certificate after the session um and you will receive a link to watch the recording in the next 24 hours and also the slides from the session as well so if you think you missed anything um you can watch it back um so not to worry there um please do keep an eye on our social channels and on our website and sign up to our newsletter if you haven't already uh, for more information on the summer of science um as debbie said um, it's a great campaign that we've got running this summer um, and we'll be um, including lots of great information on science and uh, women in science and lots of fantastic topics there. So do keep an eye out um, and get students engaged with science as much as you can, because as Debbie says, it's a really important subject. Uh, so thank you so much, Debbie, for hosting that great session again. And thank you everyone for attending. Um, if anyone has any questions, please do email us um, at the email address on the screen or the social channels um, and hopefully we'll be seeing you at our uh, future Summer of Science events. Um, and yeah, thank you very much, Debbie. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, everyone. See you Bye, soon. Everyone. Have a great evening. Thanks again. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.